Manchester to play chess in 1948. Then we see the field is over 70 years old. And if I reflect and think back as to how long I've been working within it, that's nigh on 40 years and over half its life. And over that time, I've seen fashions and fads come and go. Hype hit the presses only to fade away. But I've never before seen the hype and excitement around AI that is crescendoing now. What if you could provide analysis to help clinicians make more informed choices for their patients? You could simplify complex information in real time. You could identify options for patients who need them the most. You had a solution that provided insights to help you identify therapeutic options for your cancer patients. What if this was all possible? On the screen behind me are some examples of AI and deep learning that not long ago would have appeared far-fetched in the pages of science fiction. At the top right of the screen, we see IBM's Watson for genomics being used to rapidly provide variant interpretation based on sequencing data from a patient's tumor sample, promising a revolution in healthcare. On the bottom right, we see a colleague's work using a stochastic diffusion search. This is a system that deploys a swarm of 10,000 simple ant-like creatures to highlight areas of potential interest in bone scans. And on the right of the screen, we see a photograph of me doing something that if you know anything about the trichromatic theory of vision, seems kind of magical. What it's doing, this system that we, we, we trained at TCIDA in Goldsmiths, it's taking a gray level image as input and it's producing a color image as output. Now, before you get too carried away, we're not claiming that that colored image is a grand truth image. The alert, visually alert amongst you might notice that in the image, my rings are gold, whereas in reality, they're silver. But the point is that this system is producing a believable colored image from only a black and white image as input. This is how a radiologist diagnoses pneumonia. 84 year old female, shortness of breath period, frontal and lateral views of the chest period. This is an algorithm called ChexNet that's trained to do the exact same task. And this is how it performed against six doctors analyzing 50 chest x-rays for pneumonia in a recent test at Stanford. ChexNet is one of many projects exploring how artificial intelligence can take over tasks normally done by doctors. And it has some radiologists worried that AI could one day replace them. That's because algorithms are getting really good at interpreting images and diagnosing disease, sometimes with greater accuracy than humans. So, reflect. Should you, as radiographers, be getting worried about artificial intelligence? Well, to find answers to that question, we first need to review a little of the troubled history that underpins artificial intelligence. I want to begin at the beginning. In 1946, there was the first of a series of conferences that launched the subject of cybernetics the subject of my first undergraduate degree that's become known as the 1946 Macy Conferences. The explicit aim of these conferences was to foster and promote meaningful dialogue between scientific disciplines. And to give you a flavor of the sorts of dialogue, the following were discussed at the first Macy Conference. Self-regulating and teleological mechanisms, Simulated artificial neural networks emulating the calculus of propositional logic. Anthropology and how machines might learn how to learn. 
object perception feedback mechanisms, perceptual differences due to brain damage, compulsive understanding, compulsive repetitive behavior. So a wide variety of topics. But of particular interest to me as someone who spent a lifetime working in artificial intelligence, at that conference as you had the first attempts of a particular approach to understanding AI take root. The approach that thought it would be useful to, uh, on the way to building intelligent machines to try and understand how human uh, brains functioned. Now the second of the conferences I want to foreground to you have become known, it's become known as the 1956 Dartmouth Conference. This was a summer-long conference attempted by some great luminaries in the field of AI, including Marvin Minsky, John McCarthy, Newell, Simon, uh, Claude Shannon et al. And it was the very conference where McCarthy coined the term artificial intelligence. Now at this conference, two schools of AI began to emerge. The first thought it would be interesting and mostly productive to build intelligent machines by trying to simulate how the human brain worked, as an approach that was become known as connectionism or artificial neural networks, so-called sub-symbolic or connectionist artificial intelligence. The second approach, which now we think of as symbolic artificial intelligence, believed that the best way to build intelligent machines would be by it to instantiate a formal world model where intelligence is realized by performing explicit computations on symbols. So we have the idea that intelligence is fundamentally symbolic and the way that we realize intelligence via expert systems is by manipulating symbol structures in all sorts of clever ways. And in the early days we had great progress with this particular type of artificial intelligence. It's the work that led to the Mycin expert system that was widely used in medicine. However, not long after, there was a seismic event occurred. In 1969, Marvin Minsky, and I should flag that Minsky's PhD thesis was in neural networks or connectionism, Marvin Minsky and Seymour Pape published a book that would have a massive effect on neural computing worldwide. It was called Perceptrons. To understand the effect of perceptrons, we have to remember that in the 60s, neural networks typically had one, were consisted with what we now think of as single layer neural networks. They had one layer of active processing artificial neurons. And people had derived learning methods for automatically calculating the weights and thresholds of these networks to do interesting things. One of the most famous uh, advocates of this approach in the 60s was a guy called Frank Rosenblatt who famously talked of his perceptron and said of it that here we have a device that for the first time has original thought. Well, Minsky and Pape in their mathematical critique they looked at the maths of what single layer perceptrons could do and illustrated on the cover of their book we see a test or an illusion can you tell me, just by looking at these, whether these lines are connected at the top and the bottom or whether there are two separate lines or more, two or more separate lines present? And that's called the problem of connectivity or connectedness. Well, Minsky and Pape showed and proved that single-layer neural networks couldn't solve that problem. They also proved they couldn't solve what's become known as the engineering parity problem, working out whether an odd or an even number of items on an image, for example. And in fact, the neural networks couldn't even solve the uniqueness problem, telling us whether that single layer neural networks, whether there's only one object on an image or more than one. And this, had an, in this publication of this book almost single-handedly stopped research in connectionism for well over a decade, well over a generation. People refused to work in the area because they thought Minsky and Pape had proved that neural networks were not going to be able to do very interesting things. Whereas all they really had shown is that single layer neural networks couldn't do very interesting things. Now in contrast to that, in 1973 in the UK, we had a report by Sir James Lytle that's become known as the Lytle Report into Artificial Intelligence. And he critiqued what we could achieve using the alternative, the symbolic, the rule-based approach. And Sir James Lytle showed 
that we might be able to get rule-based systems to solve interesting problems in the lab with very small rule-based size rule bases but as we scale up the system so more and more rules are used in the rule base to reflect more and more complicated real world situations the systems would suffer from something called combinatorial explosion the time it takes to find the appropriate rules to deploy would grow faster extremely faster which would make the deployment of these machines impractical so Soon after the Lighthill Report and after the publication of Perceptrons, AI kind of had an existential crisis. The two approaches that were underpinning it had both suffered from immensely powerful criticisms. But then, not long, I began to work in AI in 1980, and, in, and I remember going to a talk by Jeff Hinton and around 1984 at Oxford University, and it's without doubt the most exciting academic talk I've ever been to. There were... The main lecture theatre held well over a thousand delegates and there were two overspill theatres full, which was unusual. And the reason these theatres were full is that at that talk, uh, Rummel Hart, Hinton and McClelland um, and Williams gave their first presentation in the UK on a learning rule that's become known as the back propagation learning rule. And this showed how we could teach neural networks that had more than one processing layer between the input and output. And they famously demonstrated how we could automatically learn the solution to the XOR problem. One of the problems, if you recall, that Minsky and Pape said was not solvable by a single layer neural network. Now, had, Rummel Hart, uh, sorry, had Jeff Hinton done that alone, he'd have been, in my opinion, a worthy winner of the 2019 ACM Turing Prize, but he's done more than that because he's also one of the forefathers of what's become known as deep learning. And you're going to hear that term quite a lot, I'm sure, over the next two days. And when we say deep learning, what we don't mean are these systems thinking, scratching their heads and having deep existential thoughts like, why are we here? Does God exist? No, a deep learning system merely means that there are a lot of processing layers between the input and output of the system. And on the screen, you'll see an example of a deep convolutional network that takes as input a, 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 an, Im, an image vector of a lady, and it, as output, it identifies who that person is. It's Sarah. The question is, does that system under, really understand what it's doing? Well, in my opinion, it doesn't. It doesn't understand now, nor will it ever. And I base that uh, assertion on the work of the American philosopher John Searle, who in 1980 published a, a, a thought experiment called the Chinese Room Thought Experiment. And very quickly, Searle asserts that, imagines this, Searle is critiquing the sorts of programs that were popular at the time that purported to show that machines understood stories. When I say stories, we're not talking about war and peace, we're talking about stories of the form Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. And the sorts of questions these machines could respond to were, who went up the hill? And the machine would say, Jack went up the hill. Why did Jack go up the hill? To get a pail of water. Well, uh, some of the more excitable postgrads uh, in these labs were saying that for the first time we had machines that understood and still thought this was ridiculous. So he came up with the idea where he would be locked into a room in China and Seoul doesn't speak a word of Chinese. And in the room is a big book with loads and loads of instructions that tell him how to manipulate symbols in one stack with symbols in another, and symbols from the first two stacks with the symbols in the third, and give answers or give responses through a slot in the door to people in the outer world. So a cell, by following these rules very assiduously, he gets very good at the task, and he gives people to the outside world sheets on which are inscribed strange and eldritch symbols that he doesn't understand, but which are actually Chinese ideographs. And unbeknownst to Searle, the symbols that he's handing people in the outside world are answers to questions about a story that they've given him on one of the piles of, uh, that are in the room. So in the room, there's a pile of Chinese ideographs that define a symbol and a pile of uh, symbols that define questions about that. So there's a pile of symbols that define a story and another pile that define questions about that story. And so is giving um, answers to questions about that story that are indistinguishable from those a Chinese speaker would give. So from the outside world, it seems that the system understands Chinese, whereas so trunchantly insists that he still didn't understand a word of Chinese by performing this process very accurately. Also on here, I've shown two examples that were published very recently looking at the reclassification properties of deep convolutional networks where we see here a train network that's been trained to recognize cars by having a certain mathematical perturbation be applied to it and it can be guaranteed to misclassify a target image that looks to a human indistinguishably from the first and obviously a car. 
it gets worse because very recently a study showed how you can do a one pixel change to an image and guarantee that your deep neural network will misclassify that image. And in that slide, we see a funny example of a deep neural network that's been trained to classify turtles, identifying some of these turtles as rifles. That's how bad these things are. The rapid development of artificial narrow intelligence, mostly in understanding images, text, and videos, will have a significant impact on radiology. IBM launched an algorithm called Medical Sieve, qualified to assist in clinical decision making in radiology and cardiology. IBM's flagship AI analytics platform, Watson, got access to millions of radiology studies to help train algorithms in evaluating patient data and get better at reading imaging results. The FDA approved the first cloud-based deep learning algorithm for cardiac imaging developed by Arteris. Some experts think that within years, many machine learning algorithms added to the radiologist's toolkit will be in clinical testing in the US. However, clinicians all know that medicine is not linear. There are so many more factors in making a diagnosis than just the MRI or CT scans. And the work of radiologists is definitely not only about medical imaging. I'm sure that we will need their creativity, problem-solving skills, critical thinking, and a great eye for detail for a long time in the future. Artificial intelligence could only help do their work even better, more efficient, and faster. Thus, I cannot stress more that AI will not replace radiologists. However, radiologists who use AI will replace those who don't. In conclusion, the view that intelligence is rooted solely in ratiocination is a relatively modern one and one that has not gone unchallenged. I reviewed very quickly John Searle's famous Chinese argument that if it correct purports to show that no computer now nor ever in the future can understand the meaning of the bits they so adroitly manipulate. So the great polymath at Oxford, Sir Roger Penrose, has used Gödel's argument to show that in his opinion, no computer program now nor ever will in the future have genuine mathematical insight. And in my own small way, I've, proposed, I've published a, a reductio ad absurdum argument called Dancing with Pixies that purports, if it's correct, to show that the execution of no computer program will ever instantiate genuine feeling or emotion in a machine. Together, I think, those th if only one of those arguments is correct, it shows there's a gap, a humanity gap, between what we can achieve via computation and what the human mind can achieve. But together, all three, these were published in a paper in Cognitive Computing in the first volume of that few, some years back. Together, I think they make a very strong case for being aware of just some of the things that the human mind can do. And I think they give a, 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 a a solid foundation for understanding why it is that we've seen great progress in engineering machines do clever things like win and beat the best Go player in the world at Go. But we've seen in my lifetime virtually no progress in the associated problem of building an artificial general intelligence, a machine that can seamlessly deploy knowledge from one domain into another. And that's because whatever people tell you over the next two days, keep in the back of your mind, machines don't understand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Bishop, for your very interesting lecture. Now I invite Professor Dabroin for the 